Hello, this is Tracy Wallach, and this is another in a series of videos on systems psychodynamics or group relations theory. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce some basic concepts of systems psychodynamic theory. Systems psychodynamics or group relations theory is also known as socioanalytic theory or as Tavistock theory after the institution in which it all originated in London after World War II. Systems psychodynamics is actually an integration of a few different theories. Psychoanalytic theory, with its attention to the unconscious and defense mechanisms. Open systems theory, which looks at the relationship between a system or organization and its environment. And finally, the work of Wilfred Bion, which addresses the various ways that whole groups can behave irrationally. In this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about open systems theory, and specifically a concept called BART. BART has been described in a seminal article by Green and Mollenkamp. Briefly, open systems theory refers to a living organism's relationship to the environment. This diagram represents the idea of an organization as an open system. In order to survive, a living organism needs to take in nutrients, such as food, sunshine, or oxygen, these are the inputs to the system, transform them into what is required for survival, and get rid of what it doesn't use. For an organization, the inputs include raw materials, clients, and labor that act to transform the raw materials into a final product or service. The outputs are the final products or services that the organization offers. A system requires boundaries that separate what is inside from what is outside and allow exchanges of nutrients and waste to occur. Boundaries provide the structure that defines a system. Boundaries may be permeable, that is easy to penetrate, or impermeable, that is difficult or impossible to penetrate. If boundaries are too impermeable, too solid or too strong, no nutrients can get in and the organism dies. This is a closed system. If the boundaries are too permeable, there is too much leakage and the organism will cease to exist as a discrete or separate being. Boundaries serve to regulate what comes into the system and what leaves it. Boundaries must have the right amount of permeability for the system to survive and thrive in its environment and to perform its primary task. For example, some religious congregations may have relatively relaxed, permeable boundaries as a way of welcoming in people from the outside. Non-members, community members, and outsiders are free to attend regular services. On the other hand, in organizations such as the United States Supreme Court or a sports team has very rigid, impermeable boundaries. Only nine people can sit on the Supreme Court at any one time. A sports team, too, is comprised of a limited amount of members. Outsiders trying to breach the boundary are swiftly cast out. An important leadership function is to sit on the boundary and regulate a group's transactions with the outside world. As another example, in an automobile factory, the inputs might include raw materials, labor, capital, and the conversion process includes the various manufacturing elements. The outputs are the finished cars. In an educational system, the inputs are students, faculty, and staff, tuition, and other dollars. The conversion process includes the various forms of learning processes, and the outputs are credentialed graduates. Most organizations are much more complex than this figure, with many inputs and outputs and different task systems. Boundaries can define time, task, territory, or they may define available resources, what the roles entail, and what responsibilities people have. A factory will have different departments, such as HR, marketing, production, that need to be coordinated with each other. The tasks of each of these subsystems may at times be in conflict or compete. Rice defined the primary task of an organization as that which it must do in order to survive. We'll talk more about this a bit later.
BART is an acronym which stands for Boundaries, Authority, Role, and Task. I use BART as a way to understand how systems, that is, individuals, groups, organizations, or societies, function, and why they may or may not be functioning at their optimal levels. It's a very simple conceptual and diagnostic tool that can help uncover complicated dynamics. Groups get into trouble when there is disagreement about task, role, boundaries, and leadership, or when they are not in alignment. Let's talk about each of these in turn. Boundaries may be concrete or physical, like the walls in a room, fences around a property, or along a national border. Boundaries may also be internal or psychological and manifest as a sense of belonging or not belonging to a particular group. As noted earlier, boundaries separate what is inside a system from what is outside a system. Boundaries can define time, task, territory, or they may define available resources, what our roles entail, and what responsibilities we have. Boundaries provide the structure that defines a system and may be permeable, easy to penetrate, or impermeable, difficult or impossible to penetrate. They can be seen as the container that holds the primary task. If the container has holes in it, it's too permeable, it won't be able to hold the task. Boundaries serve to regulate a group's transactions with the outside world. Ideally, boundaries are clearly specified, agreed upon, and adhered to. When they're not, problems can arise. For example, if members of a work group each interpret their primary task differently, they may find themselves working at cross purposes. If role boundaries have not been adequately clarified, then members of a team may get into turf battles. When boundaries are taken as guidelines rather than as clear parameters, organizations can become chaotic places where meetings don't start on time, tasks are forgotten, or people have different understandings of deadlines or deliverables. Let's move now to the concept of authority. In group relations terms, authority is defined simply as the right to do work. Authority may be formal or informal and may come from above, below, or within. Formal authority derives from a body or a group, such as a board of directors or a corporation. It may also come from a job title or be assigned by a supervisor. This formal authority is often regarded as legitimate authority. Formal authority can also come from cultural norms, such as teachers, parents, community elders, etc. Formal authority must be clearly defined by the body assigning it and understood by the party taking it. That is, it must be taken up fully and not overstepped, and be accompanied by the tools to exercise it. Power may come from one's formal authority or station. Power is the ability to make people do what the authority wants through actual or implied force or coercion. It is the ultimate influence over people and resources. Supervisors have power to hire and fire employees. Power can have both significant impact and limited effectiveness and may be used in either positive or negative ways. Positive use may be the way a parent exerts power over a child to keep it from running into traffic. The negative side of power is that it can be easily abused. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Leaders who rely solely on the use of power or force and coercion may be resented. Buy-in authority is informal authority from peers or from below. It comes from the endorsement of those who ask someone to take up a role on their behalf. This kind of authority comes from people who have a stake in a leader's position and actions. This kind of authority can be very effective for lasting change. Power without buy-in authority can be empty and ineffective. Take, for example, a teacher who has formal authority that comes with a role, but not the buy-in of the students. They may be disrespected and ignored by students. Similarly, when police forces in the U.S. or other countries lose the trust and buy-in authority of a large percentage of the population they are authorized to serve, 
Their efforts to enforce order through use of physical power may be seen as abusive and inappropriate. Authority can also come from within. Personal authority is about the way an individual takes up their formal authority. It may be influenced by a number of things, personality, upbringing, social identity, life experiences, etc. Ideally, a leader has both formal and informal authority, authority from above, below, and within. In real life, a leader rarely has that degree of authorization. I'd like to talk briefly about the work of Ron Heifetz. His work is based in group relations theory, but his definition of authority differs somewhat from the classic group relations view. In classic systems psychodynamics thinking, authority is the right to do work or act on behalf of another. Authority can be formal or informal and comes from above, below, or within. When Heifetz is speaking about authority, he is referring to formal or positional authority. He differentiates this from leadership, which is more in line with what group relations thinking would view as informal authority. He defines leadership as the capacity to mobilize people to face adaptive challenges. An adaptive challenge is one that doesn't have easy answers and that requires learning on the part of the whole system. Leadership, then, is a series of activities. According to Heifetz, authority, power, and influence are critical tools, but are separate from leadership, which requires learning and buy-in of others. In fact, leadership may involve disappointing expectations of those who have conferred formal authority and telling people what they need to hear rather than what they want to hear. There are two types of roles. The first is formal or functional and is related to one's job description or the task that they've been hired to do. It is based upon the role taker's functional skills and knowledge, for example, as an educator, a doctor, a nurse, a teacher, etc. The second type of role is informal. Informal roles refer more to one's tendency to behave and relate to a group in particular ways. Informal roles are shaped by personality, upbringing, gender, culture, life experience, etc. Here are just a few examples of informal roles that can be taken up in a group. Mover, opposer, challenger, follower, observer, caretaker. Other informal roles may include a joke teller or a clown, a tension reliever, a conversation initiator, a slacker or enforcer, or a studious one. In our broader U.S. culture, everyone is supposed to want to be a leader, and so the follower role is often viewed negatively. In my view, the follower role is extremely important. It doesn't mean unquestioned acceptance of a leader's decisions. Instead, a responsible follower will challenge as well as support the leader. As I just noted, roles may be formal or informal. An individual's personal style can lead him or her to adopt similar informal roles across a range of situations. The context can also greatly influence a person's role choice. The culture or structure of the organization, the type of task, how long one has been in the group, and the dynamics of the whole group. That is, context and the group through various conscious and unconscious processes may sometimes compel an individual to take up a particular role. The last letter in BART, but not the least, stands for the concept of task. Groups join together based on similarities and to pursue a primary task. Rice defined the primary task of an organization as that which it must do in order to survive. The primary task corresponds to the mission of the organization, that is, why the organization exists and the outputs it produces. This task, with a capital T, is distinct from the day-to-day -day tasks, task with a small t, that employees complete as part of their role. Sometimes people in different departments of an organization may be so focused on their departmental or role tasks that they lose touch with the primary task of the larger organization. When BART is not in alignment, when there is disagreement about or misalignment between boundaries, authority, or leadership, role, and task, then groups can get into trouble and behave irrationally. 
The focus on the processes of the group as a whole was of particular interest to Wilfred Bion, a psychoanalyst from the Tavistock Institute in London. He described two types of groups. First, a work group, which is focused and successful in achieving its primary task, where roles and boundaries are clear, and where group members are fully authorized in their roles. The other type of group Bion described are called basic assumption groups. These are groups that get off task, behave irrationally, or act as if the primary task was something else entirely. Basic assumption groups are more concerned with psychological survival than with their primary task, and they may be disconnected from external reality while they prioritize that survival task. I'll talk more about this in a later lecture in this series. When groups are in conflict or not functioning optimally, there is a tendency to blame individuals or subgroups for their problems. This is where BART serves as a useful diagnostic tool. I look first to the structure, that is, to BART. Often, problems that look like interpersonal or behavioral issues are really structural ones. For example, an interpersonal conflict may result from team members interpreting their primary task differently or from group members being unclear about their roles or levels of authorization. So the next time you are in or observing a group where things don't seem to make sense, think about BART and ask these questions. What is the group's primary task? What roles are members taking up? Are they clear to everyone? Are they agreed upon? Do group members interpret the primary task and their roles in the same way? How are boundaries managed? How is authority delegated and taken up? How are group members authorized to do the work of the group? BART can also be a tool for new groups to use when thinking about how to proceed. That concludes this lecture in my series on systems psychodynamic theory. Thank you for joining me. For more information, please refer to the following references. Please visit my website at www.tracywallach.com.